Welcome to the CG Pro Podcast. This is episode 39 with Fred Isaac. We are CG Pro and you can follow us at becomecgpro.com or in our Facebook group. So yeah, it gives me great pleasure in our episode 39 to welcome Fred Isaac. Fred is head of product at move.ai, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. An amazing company doing groundbreaking work in motion capture driven by cameras as opposed to some of the more traditional ways that, that mocap's been accomplished. Um, Fred's had an accomplished career uh, working for Cubic Motion and Epic Games and now Move.ai. Uh, Fred, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, excited to, to be here and just uh, chat all things sort of motion capture and graphics. And, yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to to hear a little bit about how you got started in this industry and what uh, were there any kind of, especially anything that early on gave you any um, inspiration or encouragement to jump into to this crazy business that we're in, the film and games and various things in computer graphics? Yeah, um, I kind of think I took a slightly non-traditional path into the industry. Uh, in that I didn't know that I, I wanted to do it. Um, I left university and, and started working in computer vision uh, in the, the widest possible sense. I worked for a company that sold computer vision components. Um, but after doing that for a couple of years, I just felt, you know, sort of uh, slightly creatively unfulfilled and also sort of not wanting to work in, in London where I was currently based. So looked around for some more creative roles and products that could evolve the technology that, that is computer vision and uh, got speaking to cubic motion and you know the minute I heard about what the product can do what they're doing with computer vision and you know taking facial animation facial performance and in real time animating that onto digital characters um, it, you know like in the games that I played growing up and throughout my childhood and some of my favorite films I just thought well you know I've got to get, get involved in this as quickly as possible. Um, so joined that company and started working with a huge number of huge, talented animators who'd been to university, studied this as an art form, and knew it from the ground up. Um, got to learn a lot from uh, yeah, everyone at Cubic Motion and got to work with a, a team of cutting edge sort of scientists and artists there. That was kind of that uh, the whole company was, uh, you know, either an artist or a scientist or a few people sat, sat in between the two um, and worked with them to productize some of the core technology that had kind of been in-house and, and, and get that out um, so other people could get their hands on it. Um, you might see the Siren demo that Tencent, Cubic Motion, Vicon and, and Epic did together. Um, and that was my first expo exposure to, to the industry and one of the cooler things that uh, got to be a part of going to show that off and you know first time live facial animation of that higher quality had been done uh, and from there you know I was hooked you know, I was kind of day one of it and uh, yeah got to work on some awesome projects with Cubic and uh, Cubemotion then got acquired by Epic and got to do some other awesome projects like uh, The Matrix Awakens which was uh, a very sort of surreal moment because one of the things that had you know got me inspired about science fiction and fantasy was the matrix and that was remote due to being covid when it was shot um speaking with keanu reeves and carrie amos uh, remotely was just uh, a mind-blowing and a huge great experience um and then recently kind of moved to move ai in the last six months and, and got to kind of take some of this higher end technology that i've worked on in the past and really try and democratize that which is something you know, I, I love doing just getting the tools out there into the hands of as many people as possible amazing wow so it, it sounded like you did have some some flashes of inspiration early on from things that you'd loved in games and, and film that kind of was there something that that kind of drew you towards computer vision because that kind of led you on that path down i can't really say there was uh, something other than i needed a job when i finished university uh, I'd done a technical degree in studying chemistry, but I knew I didn't want to do that any further. Um, it was kind of actually after doing that for a few years and reflecting on what do I really love, what do I go and choose to do in my free time, which is play video games, watch science fiction, play board games with my friends. I was like, how can I get involved in 
in that in that, in that creative process I, I can't draw i can't write but you know I, I believe there are applications for computer vision in in this industry so i i make tools for creative people now and that's uh, something I love, you know, being able to contribute. Uh, my kind of the thing I'm good at is taking highly technical things and, and translating those into kind of user experiences or in the reverse, speaking to creative people, understanding their needs, what they want to do, and, and, and communicating that back to, to highly technical people to actually create something out of a product they can use and use in their creative process. So, uh, yeah, so I. I I would never call myself a creative. I, I love empowering them and working with them. And it's kind of the best energy I've ever had. So, you know, now I'm in the industry. I know I never want to leave it. Fantastic. Yeah, well, I mean, creativity is a pretty broad um, idea in a way. You know, most people, I think, pen it towards art and music and things of, of visual nature in general. But really creativity in its essence is is taking combining things in new ways and as such i think that lots of things in the technical spectrum are also creative in in development i'm i'm saying that because i spend a lot of my time doing technical things and trying to convince myself i'm creative too <laughs> fair, fair enough yeah okay maybe we've gone through the same journey there then uh because uh yeah i certainly uh... Maybe I'm always trying to convince myself that I'm not creative because I'm so inspired by what you know other people can see these tools that I have and working with every day, and they just completely kind of turn them on their head. What what they're doing with them, um, you know, one of the the beta testers for Move AI, we've got this system which markless motion capture. You just need a number of iPhones to put around where you're performing and. You know, I thought video games, I thought film and TV shows, I, I thought of all these use cases. And he said, oh, I want to teach people how to be safe with lifting boxes up and down. And, you know, that's a, thinking in such a different way that I had possibly been uh, thinking about with how to use this technology. And that was one of the first people to use it. So I, I can't do it for all these various reasons with the current technology and just seeing the influx of different people we're from these different domains that haven't been able to use motion capture before haven't had the time to do animation and are now kind of enabled to start building and, and creating things has been super inspiring whilst i've been working on move ai and we just want to really continue that mission as a company of yeah uh, removing the creative barriers from people of you know needing hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of motion capture equipment or years of training in and animation to to at least get started or get get going we want to be able to put those tools in, in everyone's hands ideally that's great no well, that's really great to hear yeah i mean it's something that seems to be capturing the imagination of so many people at the moment across many different industries i know earlier we we're talking about simulation certainly in that realm but particularly in film obviously games there's obviously the um the new content creators, people creating things on YouTube of their own, the, like the kind of YouTubers, if you like, or content creators that, that really seem really interested in this. And I know that mocap, mocaps has been that kind of thing that's been a big room, a big expensive room that you have to rent for 30 grand or more sometimes per day. Um, but now <clears throat> it the, they were seeing more accessible ways of, of doing it so i'm really interested to hear more about um how how did how has that come about what what what, what has been the kind of evolution from traditional mocap into this uh way of doing it yeah sure thing um quite a funny story I, i'm not one of the founders of the business but uh one of the founders is uh, a sports marketer by trade he's done you know some massive sports marketing and VR marketing things in his background. And then there was a PhD student at King's College London and speaking at a conference about sports science, sports technology. Uh, one founder, the sports marketer said, look, no one at the moment can make any use of this video data for human performance analysis. Um, if anyone can do it, I'll give you 50 quid. Um, and the other, that was, one of the founders and another founder, Tino, the PhD student, uh, said, can I get your email address um, and that video footage you want to get some information out? I, I can I can do that. Um, and I'll, I want that 50 quid tomorrow. So 
he went away. Uh, sent him an email the next day with some kind of human performance, uh, you know, some motion capture essentially from some of a, a football video feed. Um, and from there, they got chatting and, and, and formed a company together. And, and the company been going for three years now. For the first year and a half, two years, um, started looking at sports, started looking at replacing the traditional motion capture industry, uh, working with some really top level customers, clients, EA is the big one we can talk about because we did a talk mm. with that at SIGGRAPH, which I recommend watching. So it's not just, uh, if you want to kind of hear an opinion that isn't Move AI's opinion on <laughs> what this technology can do. Um, and we, yeah, we ended up working with them and we worked with them for a, you know, probably the first 18, well, after six months of getting off the ground for the next 18 months, we worked with them and a number of other people, but, we took a step back kind of two years ago and said, how many more electronic arts are there out there in the world who, who want to do motion capture, markerless, who aren't kind of served by the current industry? And we said, there's a great number of companies out there. They've allowed us to work with them, push the technology forwards um, to, to that level that, you know, they're comparing it with the incumbent. But, you know, yeah, as you can imagine, they do a lot of, Different types of uh, sports, uh, fighting, all this, uh, all these different types of games where it would be ideal if they could capture in situ rather than getting someone to put on a motion capture suit and do it. But you know they weren't going to let the quality drop, so we had to prove to them that, that we could match that quality. Mm. And we said, look, there aren't you know thousands or tens of thousands of this type of customer out there for us. We want to, you know. Get a, go wide we want to really sort of change the dynamic of this and we looked around and we saw the likes of roadblocks fortnite creative and and, and the huge growth in in creators there i think one of the statistics was something like they had 500,000 creators in 2016 and now there are 10 million roblox creators in 2022 um you know they are currently hand animating roblox characters if they want to put a new thing in there now it's not the most complex thing in the world uh, a roblox rig but you know they can do some awesome stuff with it and we thought well here's a market we can go and introduce a tool that will enable them to create new exciting pieces of content that couldn't be created before and so we uh thinned down the list of uh, high-end customers we were going for we stopped pursuing new ones and, and just work with those that had really committed to us, chosen to partner with, and we still work with them. And they, they're pushing our top end. And then we are now looking to productize. And we've got the beta running at the moment, this uh, creator kind of tier. We're looking for that indie creator, that small studio, the previous department. These people who haven't necessarily had access to the motion capture suite department or, you know, would love to block out and get going quickly with animation or, yeah, just wouldn't have had access to it before. And we're productizing with these creators in mind, people who haven't done motion capture before. And we just have seen this huge upswell in people saying, well, I, I never thought I could create this piece of content that was in my head uh, because I was not based in the West or, you know, I can't afford it. Or, um, you know, I, I'm an animator. I never got allowed in the mocap suite to go and do it. I just got handed it to clean up. Now I can capture my own movement and, and pitch it back to my animation um, need that look. I think we should do it this way differently, and that's kind of who we're targeting. We're not trying to replace the current mocap systems out there. You know, the mocap operators. We're trying to totally change how people think about motion capture. As not you go into that big expensive room, but just oh, I want that 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 bit of motion that I've seen out there in the world in my three D engine in my three D tool, and I can just get going with it. Um, mm. I'm not thinking about it as a huge production process. So that's kind of some of the shift and kind of where we've come from. We've got these top end people who have pushed us, let us get to where we are. And now we're trying to productize to, to meet this. People who weren't necessarily even asking for this as a product because they didn't know it could be done. Right. <clears throat> well, I think there's a lot of curiosity out there about mocap. And, but I think a lot of people have assumed that it's really expensive but even even when it comes down to a, some of the more affordable suits that are out there now they're still for for many um <clears throat> expensive relative is you know expense is a relative concept um 
So where <clears throat> where are you guys at at the moment with um, yeah? I guess the product and the kind of price range and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And um, for what you can say, the, yeah, no, no worries at all. So in the final um, final throes of releasing pricing, we're going to release it this month. Um, it's going to be uh, kind of single dollars a day for unlimited motion capture. Uh, mm. So um, you know, less than a few hundred dollars a year total for mm. um, unlimited motion capture is, is where we're kind of targeting uh, the price point. Uh, the devices we've picked for it to work with are iPhones. And our mm. iPhone immediately conjures up really expensive in your, in most people's imagination, uh, though they have, will often have one in their pocket, but we have support from iPhone 8 through to iPhone 14 Pro, whatever the latest one is now. Um and you can mix and match them. So if you've got your old iPhone, you need two of them and a, and a computer to host or a, a Mac to host or an iPad to host. Um, and then you put these cameras up and you're controlling that from, from the third device um, or, or seventh device, you put them around. And um, that allows you to upload to the server and, and press process essentially. And then you'll see it back your animation. Um, which I would suggest for sort of a minute's worth of animation off three or four cameras, it'll take about five to 10 minutes for you to get that animation back. Oh, that's pretty great. You once you've yeah, yeah it's, it's not real time, but um, we've got a lot of our customers that have uh, kind of it works with a dailies type workflow or um, you know, works with a sort of rapid iteration where they go and press process just before they go for lunch and then they come back with the talent still available and, and we'll then kind of iterate on that. And we do have a real time product that we're also developing. That's at a higher end of the market. Um, and that's going to be released in about April time. We're working with a hardware partner to do that because it needs some mm. of the higher end hardware, but, um, as in cam camera hardware or, uh, Type. Both, okay. <laughs> multiple types of hardware. Um, it's it's a hardware vendor in the virtual production space, um, which we're going to yeah announce and, and release in, in April. But they um, yeah, do cameras and servers and screens and a whole multitude of things. Which you know we can we need both cameras and and compute on set um, essentially for for the real time systems. So um, yeah. That those are expensive things uh, ultimately for, for beefy real time, but if we can do cloud processing, it's a lot cheaper, a lot more affordable. Um, and, and again, the iPhones were picked because in the US, over 50% of people have iPhones. Uh, most people live in multiple uh, uh, multiple people to a single dwelling. Um, and therefore, there's, there's multiple iPhones in there. You don't need to own these. You can borrow your friends. You can by people in the um in the office is what we've seen a lot of people um doing get a test set up and then pitch to their boss that actually can i buy two iphone 8s uh for 200 pounds 250 dollars and have a, a mocap set up um yeah, on, on our beta program so it's been really exciting to see for um yeah under under a thousand dollars people can have a, a mocap set up to do unlimited animation for the year Oh, that's very cool. <clears throat> it, um, does it work better on newer devices or is um, it just as good on the older iPhones? So just as uh, slight caveat, um, so iPhone 8 and iPhone 10 and iPhone SEs, they've got a one times lens on them. iPhone 11 onwards, they have a, an ultra wide lens. The quality of animation that comes out is identical, but the newer generation, so from iPhone 11 onwards, allow you to work in a much smaller space because okay. they can yeah. be twice as close to the volume actually a one times lens you, you need quite a lot of distance from the camera to get the top of your head to yeah. your feet in to, to be able to capture the human motion and the, and the performance so um a, a lot of a lot of you know a mix and match there is, is often the way uh, a lot of our users do it they have couple of new iPhones, they've got an old iPhone that they might use as the host device to, to control the, the, the newer ones or an iPad. So, um, but the quality is the same no matter what combination you, you have. Got it. 
And it works on iPads? Uh, it works as a host device on iPads. Um, so that means you can control the other cameras. There are some iPads that we support for uh, the cameras. The iPads tend not to have um, quite as good cameras as, as the phones. Yeah. Um, historically, um, we're working to improve the, the UX on, on the iPads at the moment. It, it's not quite what it wanted it to be. Um, but it, it does work and we've got a lot of people using it and it, it works incredibly for the host device. Okay, that's cool. I'm going to say because we're an Android house here, but the kids, they're all iPads, so I could like steal their ch my children's toys and, and do this with it. You definitely could. Uh, that is a lot of people have done exactly that or, uh, you know, they've got into the work with like their two kids' iPads, borrowed some phones and, and got a done motion capture with it. So um, that's been really exciting. Um, had uh, Corridor Digital, who you might be aware of big YouTube yeah. channel. Um, they started using our, our our platform totally organically. I uh, believe Nico found out about it. Um, not quite sure. Said through a Discord channel or something. Uh, and I was watching one of his videos, replying to some people in our Discord, and he was asking questions in it. And he said, "Oh yeah, we just went into the office, asked to borrow a load of phones of everyone in there, tested it out, and then they're looking to actually go and buy some specific hardware to, you know, not have to go and." stop shooting because a phone calls coming in on a phone and it's <laughs> right like yeah a tripod <laughs> but yeah. it's the problem with these multi do everything devices is like yeah. you've got to still take phone calls on them gets in the way yeah, exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> um, yeah so i do have i've got my sort of little mocap set up here for just testing out which is just two yep. cameras two iphone x and an iphone xr because there's no need for me to be getting top quality sort of expensive phones i just want to have the lowest end devices so i can test it and yeah i'm going to make up every week on that just to make sure that i you know i'm feeling the pain of our customers if there are problems if it's taking too long to upload or, or anything like that so um yeah really yeah work, working on that um i've seen that uh, there's a question if i can give a demo in this space it's a little small for me to give a demo but i can um Maybe we could do we could do one uh, at some point. We could do a, a webinar as well. And there's typically a lot of people listen to this as well. So even if you did yeah. do a demo, they wouldn't be able to see it. But um, that's may, maybe something we could do at some point. Yeah, that'd absolutely. be cool. Absolutely, we've got lots of content out there. We're really trying to build in the open and talk about what we're doing um, because you know we feel that's the best way to get customer feedback and the right way to do things. To be honest, so. Um, you know, we're always open to comparing ourselves to other people, commenting on where our solution isn't as good as other people's and where other people's are, are better than ours. So, yeah, if uh, you do want to go and find something, I um, you can just go on our LinkedIn, go on our website. We've got a lot of content out there and we're always willing to put the FBX files out there so you can get hold of the raw mocap we've done before kind of committing to our system or, or looking at it. Very cool. Is there, is there um, talking of capture um is there something about because it's it's filming with a camera so is there mm. something particular about it that makes it only work on iphones at the moment are you looking towards doing androids or other cameras or yeah so we started doing a really wide range of cameras um but we need to do a special calibration process for each device we support and that is a calibration of both the lens and the sensor um, we have to do that for every single device. We can't mm. mix devices very well. Um, so like you would need to use all DSLR with 35 mil lens of a, uh, yeah, of a, a Zeiss 35 mil lens, for example. Um, the iPhones have got a number of things that Apple's commitment to uh, augmented reality, mixed reality, that allow us to mix the devices to do the calibration a bit more easily to be very standardized. So whilst we can support other camera types and we do support them for our top end customers um, who are really committed to us and, and are working with us on research and development for the longer term, um, the ease of use and the standardization of the iPhones allowing us to mix and match them and making that really simple um, to do has meant there are some advantages. There are some things there that have meant it's been significantly quicker for us to develop on them 
and significantly easier for us to support them. Um, we are looking at supporting Android devices. We don't have a timeline for that mm-hmm. um, because at the moment, if we were to do it, it would be like we only support Samsung Galaxy yeah. S20 to S22. And, and that's, you know, that, that doesn't really work or, or do it. We're, we're, we're looking at ways there where we can allow people to mix and match Android devices or, or mix and match act, action cameras, for example. Um, there's nothing specific about the, the sensor camera combination of the iPhone that does it, but some of the software around it that Apple has made um, and some of the properties of um, yeah of, of the, the, the lenses and the hardware that they have calibrated and standardized over such a long period of time has made it easy for us to support a wide range of price points and, and device types. Cool. Well, yeah, it makes sense. I know there's a number of things that... That uh, they they excel at um, the <clears throat> people with doing VCAM work is generally iPads if if it's not <clears throat> mocap. So yeah, that makes sense. Um, cool. Yeah, it's it's exciting to to hear about how the 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 price. I know that's changed significantly over time since you guys have been doing it. So it's really it's really cool to to hear how how accessible it's becoming. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that really came about from building in the open, talking about our price point and, you know, trying to make it work and, you know, hearing people's feedback that like, yeah, that sounds great value compared to X, but actually it doesn't, you know, whether that's Rococo, Xsense, Vicon, whatever it is, it sounds like great value in comparison. It doesn't shift the ways of working because it's still in that thousands tens of thousands of, of pounds ballpark so we've really heard what our customers have said and they're trying to change the way of working and you know make a sub one thousand dollar total system for for motion capture that's hardware that's software that's everything you need to to get going um right with it so that's always been in, in our minds what's the <clears throat> what's um can you tell me some of the stuff about like what a kind of best average setup would look like like in terms of number of cameras size of space lighting yeah, sure. any yeah you know, what what does that look like yeah so the we've kind of got three setups i would describe um we've got the the minimalist the, the lowest cost the lowest end possible would be three iphone eights um that two cameras kind of uh, put out at sort of 90 degrees away from the actor in front of them um and they can then perform if something gets hidden from them our system has got physics models it's got kinematics models in it so just because the arm has disappeared our system doesn't think the arm no longer exists it goes okay i I know what human motion is meant to happen i know how a human is meant to move I saw the arm go there. I'm going to assume it goes there. Ultimately, if you're doing something totally different behind it that we never saw happen, we can't predict that. But for example, sitting down, just because it's lost your spine, it doesn't think you've fallen to the floor or your spine has disappeared. It thinks you're sitting in a chair and and, and will hold you in that chair until you get back up. You've then got, uh, that can cover a space from as small as kind of two meters by two meters um through to uh, a volume of about six meters by six meters um we then have the kind of ult- the the best one one actor setup where if you've got one actor without many props that'll be four cameras uh, four corners of a square essentially um again that's covering about six meters by six meters um it would be on tripods at about one and a half to two meters in height uh, but you don't have to use tripods. Um, I've got uh, some gorilla pods that I would just wrap around chairs at, if I'm doing testing at home or I just put on a table. So about one, one and a half meters, two meters in height, but you can have them high up mounted against the walls just to try and really push the volume a bit. It doesn't, you can have them mounted in any configuration you want as long as the actor's head to the foot of their body is uh, to their feet and the contact in the floor is, is in the shop. Uh, to start with and then we've got our multi-actor setup so that's six cameras that's the maximum number of cameras we support um you have them arranged in kind of 
two semicircles of three or you know a circle with six cameras placed around it that's eight meters by eight meters that can support up to three actors it can support four but the quality starts to drop off a bit because they start including each other so much um or it can support uh, fewer actors but with more props for example tables and chairs within the scene or having someone on a on a stationary bike and cycling within within the scene that's something where i'd say having six cameras is beneficial because uh, kind of multi some feeds might not be able to quite see all of the angles but with six cameras um uh, varying heights between one and two meters you can cover most um, scenarios there so those are kind of three setups but we can do three camera we can do five camera we can do anything at yeah, two to six um we've had some really inventive people on our beta program like making it work in their living rooms in their homes uh we've had people suction cupping them to the windows we've had them uh, uh people you know sort of mounting them to trees in their garden it, it's really not some sort of highly precision thing that needs to do that to get the quality of the animation there uh the things that do affect the quality having your wrists covered quite a lot of long sleeve tops will cover your wrists makes it very hard for us to get the hand motion correct so a kind of short sleeve or you know short sleeve top helps um all black outfits or all single color outfits again it makes it quite hard for our system to differentiate between the different body parts when they're crossing over each other so we always ask for a kind of contrasting top and bottom and, and ideally not all black um and again contrast from the background it doesn't have to be you know orange versus green or, or white versus black but um you know if you've got a magnolia wall don't be wearing a magnolia t-shirt would be the uh the thing <laughs> to get the request you know i've got a white wall behind me i'm wearing a white top that would be absolutely fine in terms of contrast um it's just you know it's often black on black where suddenly if the human eye can't sort of see the difference our, our system can struggle there as well oh it shouldn't be wearing a magnolia t-shirt anyway hey i i'm I'm not going to question other people's fashion choices. I'm wearing a company branded gilet in my own home, uh, sort of yeah, at nine o'clock on a Tuesday night. So hey, I'm not not one to judge. It's a nice black though, not a magnolia. I've nothing against magnolia for anyone out there. Please don't feel like I'm judging you either. I'm also wearing a company t-shirt. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's cool. So. It's so been... <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I was just going to ask another couple of questions about the um, so the this max size you could do is about eight meters by eight meters. The number of people is kind of three, possibly four. Um, somebody asked a question here: um, Can the system do animal mocap? Has it been trained mostly on people? Do you, have you trained any so, animals? Animal so data. Animal yeah, animals and props are two highly requested um, things for us to do at the moment. Unfortunately, we can't do animals and we can only do one prop type at the moment, which is a, a circular ball. Um, our system, we really want to be markless. Um, there's a real limited data set out there for animal motion, mm. which our system does use artificial intelligence. It's, it's not the only thing our system does. It's one component of it our, our physics and kinematics models are super important for making the motion realistic but how we do the tracking and some stuff like that you know uses elements of artificial intelligence we don't have the data set there for animals uh also the minute you do one animal type uh you've got to do them all or you've got to do a, a huge number of them they've got such different gates and such different motion the, um, it's something we look at, we keep revisiting, we keep going, okay, we've got an idea, let's try it. We haven't found one that hits the scale or, or, or the thing we want. And the same with prop tracking. Uh, can I track a weapon? Can I track a thing I'm holding? Can I track this? And again, there's just not the, the volume of training data out there for us to add the, the, the tracking um elements to the system so so then to, to replicate the physics of it properly um what we have seen uh, people do and, and the way we've got the animation to look really nice is you can have a prop you can be holding a, 
a stick that you're swinging um, and then people putting that into uh, Unreal Engine 5.1. There's some new uh, IK solvers they've got that are really good. You can uh, parent objects to them and, and putting the correct object in, parenting that to, to the hands and getting absolutely incredible results out of it. So the, the work the Unreal Engine team there have done is, is absolutely stellar for adding uh, props, I, I think, in, in all working with our animation and, and that would be the workflow I'd suggest for anyone who wants to do it. It's like 3D scan the prop you want to work with, get it going, pin it to your character's hands. We'll get the motion of the, the human motion holding that and, and actually it gets working really nicely um, for a lot of people there. Do it in post as such. Yeah, do it in post or, you know... Uh, Real-time post. Near real time. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's always uh, interesting sort of discussing these real-time, is this a real-time workflow or not, um, where we've got this animation that's playing back and then you've got someone recording more animation, but it's not quite in sync or, or doing things there. So, um, yeah. That's great. Yeah, well, it's... it's... There's uh, another question here that just came in. <clears throat> so somebody's asking, what about capturing qu quick motion? I'm assuming they mean fast motion. Could you capture someone running or moving very quickly through the capture space? So running, th so actually we had a very interesting uh, example very, very early on in the beta where it shows that our system is is yeah not flawless uh, but uh, it can work really well so we had a uh, one person messages saying this works incredibly well on my bike thank you so much for doing this and we had someone else message us say i tried doing this whilst riding a bike and it just didn't work and we were like okay like what's going on here like can you send us your takes the first person um stood in there with the bike propped against him, did the T-pose to start, which is how we start. You, know, you clap three times, you do a T-pose, is how you start using our system. He got on the bike, he cycled around the volume, it looked brilliant, it was getting it right, it was sort of a chopper-style bike, you had the right positions, the legs were going, he got off, it worked, he picked the bike up. It's absolutely brilliant. The, the next take we go to look at, a totally different person, blank for the first 10 seconds and then this guy comes herring through the volume sort of going at a I don't know 10 miles an hour at least you know properly cycling hard um we don't capture anything the character we tried to track had just disappeared uh, off and it, it just didn't work so we can absolutely capture fast motion going back to kind of what I said uh, earlier and where we came from it was sport it was running around pitches, it was looking at football data, we can absolutely get people moving quickly around the volume, but we have to have them start within the volume to, to do that performance. Um, and yeah, that, that would be what I'd say about that is, yeah, we can do fast motion, we can do quick motion, we work with sports, work with sports governing bodies, uh, right. testing this and uh, evaluating it. But um, yeah, just got to start in the volume, we can't be charging through it for it to work. Do it right, people, and it'll work. Hey, I think, you know, if every one of our users was charging through the volume, they're doing it right, and our technology just isn't quite working correctly. Uh, we, need to, we need to make it work for them. Um, but, yeah, we uh, told the guy how to do it, uh, and he got it working really well once he realized he needed to just start on his bike in the volume. So, uh, got it. Got it's interesting how much <clears throat> how much this stuff has come from sport even going back really far in terms of motion study to like my bridges work all those books that animators have used since the 1800s <clears throat> when he did his original studies of human and animal and various different types of motion where but that, that guy invented the cinema camera bullet time all sorts of stuff it's crazy how much that has uh has come from that world I think it's it's fascinating how much of particularly motion capture and and then that feeding back into animation has come from non art non artistic sources um, where I think about for example facts you know uh, that came from uh, I believe it was sort of linguistic studies it wasn't trying to create some animation tool but it was trying to describe human facial uh, motion and emotion and and this scientific and brought linguistics here, and then suddenly someone was like, "Wait a second, I can use this for animation," and, and brought that 
brought that across. And um, sport has been a huge part of us pushing animation quality. Um, I I was what you know one of the the I think I was the second hire that had actually had some animation experience or worked in an animation company before joining. Um, and actually, I think that's what allowed us to push to such high quality and such extremes because the team made great leaps forwards in, in the quality of animation and the quality of motion capture, but um, because they didn't know what the baseline was, you know, if it had been developed at Cubic Motion, we would have handed it to the animators that were working on projects and it would have sped them up 5 10%. But because no one could do any animation within the business, the mocap had to work properly end to end and, and look realistic. So the research team and, and the development team and everyone working on it just kept improving and iterating on the system to improve the quality of motion capture until it was a, this incredible parity with some of the optical systems rather than sort of stopping and moving it in and using it as an augmentation tool for uh, an animation workflow, for example. So kind of, being that outsider, focusing on sport and, and these other applications is actually what allowed us to then come to the animation industry and, and the film and, and this side of people who want motion data and be like, look, here you go, we've got hyper-realistic uh, matching of, of this and, and can put this into all of these different environments. Right. What, would, <clears throat> what were you doing with, um, so you were with Cubic Motion at, at the time when they were bought by Epic? Yeah. What was that uh, experience like and what was it like um, working with Epic? Yeah, sure. I think it's quite a hard uh, hard one to answer because of when we got bought. Um, so we got acquired a week or two weeks before uh, UK announced lockdown for COVID. Oh. Um, so it was uh, quite a different time for everyone. I saw an absolutely amazing response to the pandemic from Epic and really supportive of workers and getting people safe and sent everyone home actually before a lot of the governments had. So it was a, a really strong and powerful thing to see. It was then an absolutely incredible experience working across so many different projects with so many different experts. Like if you wanted to talk to someone about time code, you could go and speak to someone that had potentially been on the committee that had helped set up time code or had mm. written a new standard or there was always a, an expert you could turn to a, and work with, um, which was an absolutely amazing experience to have and, and to have that. And then you got to work on these projects that had a scale impact outside of every time you thought, okay, this is what this is going to do. I, I was part of the Digital Human Initiative under uh, Vladimir Mastolovich and the three lateral team and, and their team and massive credit to them and what they brought to Epic with the MetaHumans and got to be a part of that and, and help work on some of the back-end systems there. Really pioneered top high-quality human assets and being able to get under the hood and, and see and learn and understand that process was absolutely incredible. Um, and then releasing that for free to a huge number of people when you know, assets of that quality were thousands, if not tens of thousands of pounds, uh, was super exciting and something you could only have done within Epic um, where... You know, there were, he had the energy of the business that could feed back into and, and that kind of circular economy side of things. Um, so it was absolutely incredible to be able to go and work across all of these different projects. Um, at the same time, I, I did leave to go and work for a, a smaller startup company because um, I, I wanted to kind of have a, a bigger impact on the projects I worked on because there were so many experts and the projects were so vast. I, I sometimes personally felt lost in terms of what my contribution was to it so um that that was part of part of the move there but um uh, absolutely love epic love working with epic we um move ai received an epic mega grant and we are now giving back to the mega grant community where if um, someone has received a mega grant we now give them uh, free move ai uh, processing time uh, on the system so they can go and do animation and create new projects. And we've worked with um, a huge number of mega grant recipients to try and help and support them. I believe you've had Haz on the podcast yeah. before. Yeah. yeah with him, he helped us push and develop, but we've had others like Mitzi Make use it. Um, 
know, have a few others to mention. So um, yeah, absolutely love working with them as a company and think they're doing an absolutely incredible thing. Um, both love working for them and, and now I'm working with them in, in kind of a partnership uh, scenario. No. Very cool. Yeah, I, I know uh, know how you feel. I think it's very different working with big organizations and small. And I like I kind of like both at this point. I like the as you said, be, be like the ability to be able to have more influence in a small company. And of course, in big companies, you can have more resources. You can do crazy big things. But uh, yeah, sometimes you're a, you're a smaller part of it. They're both. I think I've I've really enjoyed doing both throughout my nice. career as well. Absolutely. I think I've been blessed to have the experience of both. And I think, um, you know, uh, learning some of the mission that Epic has about the democratization and uh, wanting to make these tools accessible to people and seeing what they've done, um, you know, it's definitely stuck with me and will stick with me because it's something I want to do and something Move wants to do as, as well, which is democratize, make these things easier to use, um, make it easier to do so. Um, very easy to work with both uh, and then you've got this bigger impact potentially at the bigger company with the the, the bigger resources but uh, yeah then you've got to be able to move in a, in a more agile way and, and, and yeah. iterate from you know high end down to low end and think about the democratization rather than potentially you know taking longer to make that move at a, at a bigger company Oh, cool. Yeah, I feel I feel the same way at CG Pro. We have a passion for being able to help get the the information out there as a school yeah. in the same way. We, that's a big part of our mission as well. A good uh, part of why we do this, in fact. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. I think um, one of the things I, um, we are, we're also working on a lot at the moment is trying to yeah, get this out of the hands of people. We're launching our create a tier system in, in March time. Uh, so 1st of March we, is the, the launch date we're, we're going for. Um, and so at the moment we've got a free beta program. If anyone wants to sign up for it and do as much motion capture as they can between now and the end of March, it's absolutely free for them to get on, try the system out, um, buy some iPhones, use them for 30 days, and then return them if they don't think oh, our motion capture system is good enough. Uh, but we've, we've certainly not been seeing anyone do that so far. Um, and then we're going to launch officially with a, a paid tier in, in March and, and go from there so people can have a bit more stability because we do have some beta users at the moment saying, oh, what's going to happen once the beta's over? Can I use it on a, an actual production and things like that? So that's kind of the next steps for us is to get that launch out there, give people that stability to know this is how much animation they can create and this is what we're going to be doing for, for a longer period of time you know, just give them that stability to know please do use this on active productions they've still got a couple of months to jump in on the beta yeah still a month and a half um I, you can do a hell of a lot of that animation in a month and a half if you uh want to try it out um and please do we've got a really active discord community now that are sharing content they're producing helping each other out um it's great as most of our guys are based in uh, European time zones that we log up into the Discord in the morning and we see like 90% of the questions have been answered by people in the community. So it's it's something again, building in the open, being open about where we are, what we're working on, what we're doing. Uh, people are coming up with in, ingenious solutions for mounting, for different setups they can have. We've got people talking about how to shoot an l-shaped room it's not something we've done you know now we've got two people on the discord who it's a funky setup like we'll wait for them to answer before us some of the time because they've they've tried to do it they or they, they have done it whilst uh you know we've just bought a tripod or, or done it differently uh, they've bootstrapped it and really got it going so um cool. do, people do what's um go for it. What? Uh, how can how can people find your beta program and your Discord? So yeah, we can share those links move, with people. We can share links, but move.ai. Um, if you go onto our website, sign up. Um, you have to fill in a small amount of information there. Um, one of the will say sign up to the beta on the website, and um, yeah, you'll get an invite within uh, a week at the latest, but. It's normally within 24 hours uh, we invite people um, and yeah they'll 
get invited to the sign up and, and download the app from uh, the moment it's in test flight, which is uh, Apple's way of having a beta with it before you're on the app store. Uh, get sent the link to that, get sent the link to, to log in to our website, and they'll be able to get off there. And in the invite, they'll also be sent a link to our Discord channel as well. Um, okay. So both in, in one in one fell swoop, you can get one both. One fell swoop. Yeah, we also post the, the Discord link on all of our LinkedIn posts and things like that. So if people go and have a look at our LinkedIn or Twitter, they'll be able to find the Discord. Um, if people also want to go and have a look at the animation, find us on um, LinkedIn, move.ai, um, and we're posting uh, regular kind of pieces of content where we also post the FBXs to go alongside that. We recently did a comparison to the Rococo V2 suit where we posted the FBX files for that so people can go and have a look at the animation quality themselves and, and download uh, the, the raw data from both systems so they can see you know, what, what the output data was like and test it out for themselves before committing to, to either systems, really. Um, We'll see that on Twitter um, at moveai underscore official. Um, this one. Awesome. Yeah, we'll we'll definitely um, do our best to share those as well. The awesome. uh, I was going to ask what the what's the cal calibration phase like? Cause it, how long does it take, and what, what does it involve? Yeah, sure. So the, the setup process for our systems um, fairly simple. Put the cameras around the volume. Uh, we then do need to do what we call a calibration take. Um, what that's doing is calibrating the volume. Um, so you clap three times and then pretend you're being, uh, we do a Y pose or, or pretend you're being stuck up in a, in a Western. So your hands are up by the side of your head, don't shoot. Uh, and then walk around the volume that you're in um, and then upload that with the, the rest of the videos and, and run that and, and process that calibration. What that's doing is saying, don't motion capture anyone outside of the volume. When we first designed and built the system, we had uh, our system was just latching onto people that two cameras can see that were like outside of the volume. So we had to put a calibration process in. So you write, uh, you need to input the actor's height that's calibrated the volume. And that then says like to the system, don't motion capture anyone who isn't inside the, the, the volume whilst you're processing, or sorry, whilst you're recording. Um, it doesn't need to be the same actor that is then performing. So you can have a sort of technical person set the system up, calibrate it on their height, and then get an actor in to perform. Every take, we then ask people to clap three times and T-pose at the start of the take. The clap helps the synchronization process. It's, it's one step of it. Um, the iPhones, have their timing. We've also added time code support in, in the next release so you can synchronize to other audio on a camera, um, facial capture systems. Um, but the clap is kind of the backup, the last line of defense of, you know, find the sound peak and, and look for that. that and we've got a system that will look for that if all other synchronization methods have failed. And then T-Pose just allows the system to lock on for a second before Perform. What what about um uh hand, that's another question I was gonna ask hands and face? Yeah. So facial animation, we don't do anything for that. Um we've yep. looked at it, um, but we don't have a solution that we think beats the market or does anything different for the market. So um what we've done instead is is test with a face wear helmet, uh iPhone on a a bike helmet, iPhone on a professional sort of mounting system, and we can do our motion capture no problem with one of these helmets on that's uh, mm. capturing facial animation. We then have a hand solution. The hands is done a bit differently to um, the rest of the animation. So uh, with all the other types, we are looking for 3D data. With the hands, we pick one camera feed and then do kind of animation off the fingers and hands uh, but we do that off just a single image due to AI we've, we've tried it on and been able to do that and then feed that back into the, the physics and kinematics model so you, you can imagine you've got sort of two tracking models going on the, the body tracking and then the hand tracking um, it's good it can't work if we can't see everything so um, 
if you know it's grip something the physics model will hold on and we can do it if you are however doing this and blocking uh, putting your hands behind one another and, and wiggling your fingers our system is more likely to, to struggle uh, and i would suggest using a pair of uh, gloves like the manis or the stretch sense which we integrated and work with both of those systems no problem at all but for a lot of people our hand tracking works uh, and hand animation data works really well uh, it tends to be people using the bigger volumes where our hand animation system isn't quite as strong is it further away less pixels to further away out. less pixels it's very small relative to the image but um, yeah. for most of our users uh, they're really pleased to just get some data out of the hands and, and you know have a starting point really um, yeah that's cool so, so um, <laughs> yeah no i can i can imagine i'm th my brain's already fit trying to trying to think about the problem i'll i'll stop it from doing that um I'm doing an interview. The uh, I was going to ask you about um, what your <clears throat> what are some like things that you want, would love to see solved or things you're excited about in the future. Uh, yeah, I think uh, this is product product manager hat on here at the moment. I think uh, seeing the improvement in interoperability uh, between different engines, getting files between different places and locations, and just getting them working, um, retargeting is the bane of my life. Uh, well, it's not the bane of my life, but you know, retargeting um, is something I'm really passionate about. For those that don't know what retargeting is, it's uh, you have a character that is a certain size, let's say it's a 10-foot ogre, and then you've got yourself that's a six-foot person. How do you get the motion of the six foot person to work correctly on the 10 foot ogre that might have a tail rigged onto it and, and things like that. And I would love to see, and I, I'm excited to see some of uh, some more standardization across rig types and how people want the motion to perform. And then just kind of that in general. So seeing people being able to pass rigs easily, I think uh, the company ready player me and it, they talk more about the metaverse, but I love what they've done in terms of rig standardization between games and working at different fidelity levels really simply between different games and different engines. And, you know, that's something I'm personally super passionate about and something I want to see a lot more of. And we're always working towards supporting Did as you many standardized... But, sorry. Oh, it just made me think of the Jungle Book. I don't know if you ever saw our hilarious attempts to... Uh, it, uh, impersonate animals in the volume on that movie. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> Went back to you know, as a Lion King, but Jungle Book was like pantomime horse kind of stuff. It was very funny. Yeah, like you know, who knows how a human is meant to move? Like a, you know, snake, a, a, a bear, a lion, whatever it is. It's you know, people do some incredible performances, but actually, how realistic do you want it versus how cartoony do you want to? Uh, and all of these things, it's uh, yeah, a real challenge. The one thing I am afraid of when I talk about standardization, though, is that uh, I think it's a, an XKDC comic where it says, oh, there's thir 13 competing standards. We're going to make a we're going to make a 14th to standardize the standards. And that's right. So we're trying to <laughs> try to pick, you know, uh, industry use things, whether that's FBX or USD. Um, we're loving what NVIDIA are doing with Omniverse and got a plug-in for them where they're saying well, it's usd the whole way everyone can yeah. work with usd let's get that working um and some of these other kind of metaverse wide initiatives we think are going to be transformative for the cg industry where they start standardizing a lot of the way things are done and data's passed around and handled so i'm really excited about them and some of their kind of knock-on effects into into other industries where um yeah you can see this um you know, people just taking the path of least resistance. Okay, we're going to use that agreed on standard rig because I know how to work on that. And I, I know how that works. And seeing that with MetaHumans coming out from Epic, you know, they came out and now a huge amount of animation and tooling is, is based around animating a MetaHuman and the MetaHuman face rig and, and this type of standardization. So very excited to see what's to come from, yeah, 
consortiums of people working together on things like that. Right. Yeah, it seems like there's a lot more initiatives like that these days. You, we need a consortium to manage the consortiums. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, the definitely committee of vision this. committee. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you know, there's so many different aspects of CG graphics and computer graphics. Is, uh, yeah. I'm sure you know teaching all these people. Uh, yeah. There's going to be a point where one committee standard butts up with another committee standard, but uh, you know, I'm sure this can be resolved over time. And, and, yeah, you know, I think so. The film industry. Yeah, I'm mean, seeing more of it than than ever. I think. I mean, I've been quite involved in in USD since it started to emerge from Pixar, and we used it quite a bit on Lion King, and I've used it okay. quite a bit since in in the first versions that appeared in Unreal, and using it through early Solaris in Houdini. It's 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 very promising, and I think that people are placing big bets on it, and things like okay. Material X, and I, I think it's it's never been. A better time for standards in CG for me. Yeah, uh, and I think it's because a lot more people are building, so they can't be building their own tool sets. You know, if you look at the history of CG, which you know, you know, it's come out of Pixar, as you said. That meant Pixar chose to go and build that whole standard themselves to go and do this. And you know, Unreal Engine's a great example. It's every games company built their own engine. Well, you know, there's going to be, you know. It's, more people want to build, but that means less people can afford to be building the, the foundational layers because they want to yeah. go and learn in one place and, and then go and implement it somewhere else. Um, so yeah, it makes sense. A lot, a lot of people going back to Unreal, um, moving away from their own engines that they've invested 20, 30 years into just because they're that you know they get to they can focus on the the things that they want to focus on the storytelling the art the creative aspects and less on up plus unreal have done such an amazing job of yeah. in, innovating uh, absolutely and i think something that isn't often talked about is learning these standardization engines like if you're then asking people to come in and work for you on um a, a real niche technology that's your own in-house technology it's, it's really hard to recruit people um to work on in-house technology now because people say well i can you know i can never leave i can never go and apply my trade somewhere else i can never go and do something myself because i won't have access to these in-house tools so um, i think that's something as well businesses are considering where this you know, real you know shortage of developers and artists and you know everyone across this space as, as it's growing so massively at the moment that's an exciting time yeah definitely um, is there anything that you want to share with people? You've already shared your Discord and various other things. Anything for you personally or anything you want to leave people with before we... Uh, no, not at the moment, I think, yeah. Just go to move.ai, sign up for the beta, give it a try if you're looking to do some mocap and, and, and share your results widely. We'll be really excited to see what people are, are making with it. Awesome. Well... Thank you so much, Fred, for uh, your time, for sharing your time today. I appreciate having you on, and it's great, great chatting with you. Thanks for having me. It's been uh, awesome to get to just talk about a topic I'm so passionate about for an hour. Awesome. Well, I hope we get to do that again soon. And yeah, thank, thank you for joining us. And thanks also to all our listeners today. Thank you all for joining in and asking some questions. And uh, we will be back with you again in a couple of weeks with another episode. Uh, we have been CG Pro. You can follow us at becomecgpro.com. We have we are a school. We train people in real time filmmaking techniques, and we have some new courses coming up in games. New new course in February, um, ICVFX uh, filmmaking, and another new course in for producers, which is uh, something that I don't think has been done before. So if you want to check us out, become cgpro.com. But thanks for joining us today on the podcast. Uh, thank you all for listening, and we'll see you all again very soon.